أعوذ بالله السميع من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين ولا عاقبة للمتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. So uh, last week I said that we weren't going to go in any chronological order and that we would take uh, one set from uh, before the Prophet Sallallahu time and then we'd kind of mix it up and um, I changed my mind. Inshallah ta'ala, we're going to take a very heavy emphasis from the seerah uh, to start this off and we're going to really look at this from the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and focus on that for some time and then we'll go after, before and jump around. But what compelled me to this was that I kept on thinking, who do we start this series with? And I got drawn into the story of Waraqa ibn Nufal because Waraqa is a very interesting character because Waraqa radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was he the first Muslim? Was he not a Muslim? Did he accept the Prophet sallallahu Did he live long enough? What's the story of Waraqa before uh, those moments? Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ever have a conversation with Waraqa before? All of these questions about Waraqa. And so I decided to go to a man that I've spoken about quite a bit within khutbahs and, and different classes and lectures but I've never really got, gotten to highlight his biography in full. And he's a companion of Waraqa, and he's, he's just a remarkable figure all around. And he deserves this level of attention, and he deserves to be the first. And of course, I thought about doing Khadija first, but then people would have accused me of being biased because of my daughter. So I decided that we'll do Khadija third uh, for a reason. The man is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayr. Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayr. An absolutely remarkable figure in the history of Islam has a story unlike any other person from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. There is truly nothing like him. And he belongs to this group of people that were called uh, the Hunafa or the Hanifiyin. Uh, not the Hanafis. I know that the followers of the Madhab of Imam Abu Hanif rahimahullah, would want this to be that the first Muslims were Hanafi, but it's a different type. They're Hanif meaning they were monotheists, a group of four monotheists that decided that they wanted to follow the religion of Ibrahim They wanted to follow the way of Abraham. They looked at their context in Mecca and they were deeply troubled by the paganism and the idol worship. And so they decided that something is wrong about this. And they couldn't quite figure out what, it, what the right path would be. But at least these four men decided amongst themselves that we're not going to follow the dominant pagan uh, culture in Mecca. And we're going to look for something else. Now, they were four. They were Uthman ibn al-Huwaydith. I'm only going to do two of them in detail. Uthman ibn al-Huwaydith was one of them. He became a Christian and he went to Rome and he actually took up a position amongst the Romans. So he kind of disappears from the, from the story of Islam very early on because he moved out of Mecca very early on accepted the religion of Christianity as a result of his rejection of paganism and became you know, a, a minister amongst the Romans and kind of disappears and falls off. There is Ubaidullah ibn Jahsh, whose story is, uh, is very interesting because he becomes Christian as well in this context, in this climate. Then when the Prophet وسلم, uh, brings Islam, he accepts Islam and he makes the migration to Abyssinia, the Hijra to Habasha, which is a Christian land. And then the sources seem to indicate that he became Christian again and died as a Christian. However, the narration that states that has some issues with it. So though it's prominent in literature that Ubaidullah bin Jahsh left Islam and became Christian again in Abyssinia and died that way, it's not a confirmed, uh, confirmed fact because there is some issue with the narration. But that's his story. Now the two that we're really going to concern ourselves with and go into detail with are Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl and Waraqa ibn Nufal. Waraqa ibn Nufal, who we'll talk about in depth next week, and to be honest with you, I'm excited to talk about Waraqa ibn Nufal because I learned a lot uh, going in depth and in, in research in his life in the last uh, week in particular. Uh, Waraqa became Christian too. But Waraqa would become a very specific type of Christian. He would become a Nestorian priest, which was the Christianity that Salman al-Farisi would follow. And we'll talk about that next week when we get into the story of Waraqa ibn Nufal. So out of the four Hanifs, out of the four monotheists in Mecca, three of them became Christian or joined some iteration of Christianity. Zayd ibn Amr al-Nufayl is never really satisfied 
with Christianity or Judaism as he sees it in his time. Instead, he insists on being a follower of the way of Ibrahim He's a follower of Abraham. He's not convinced by Judaism and Christianity as they exist. We're talking about before the Prophet has come along as a prophet, but he insists he's a monotheist and he will challenge his society in very unique ways. So let's talk about this man who is an incredibly uh, remarkable man. SubhanAllah, it's hard not to fall in love with this man when you, when you study him. And uh, it's, it's only fitting that we, that we study him first in this series of the firsts, just because of how unique his story is. So his name is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl. Uh, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl is, the, is from the Adi clan, Banu Adi of Quraysh, so it's a, it's a higher clan. And he is the first cousin of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. So just, it's always good to connect these things from a historical perspective. There's Sa'id, there's Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl, Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufayl, okay? Umar ibn al-Khattab ibn Nufayl. So that would make al-Khattab the paternal uncle of Zayd, all right? So Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nufayl is the first cousin of Umar. Um, he would only have two children. One of them is Sa'id ibn Zayd, who would become one of the 10 promised paradise. And the other is Atika bint Zayd. Atika with a kaf, not a qaf. Atika, Atika bint Zayd. So he only has two children, one son and one daughter, and we'll get back to her as well. The Prophet wasallam saw Zayd growing up and he was fascinated by him. The Prophet ﷺ never worshipped idols. Abu Bakr who never worshipped idols. But at the same time, they were not challenging idol worship in society because the Prophet ﷺ had not been called to do that. He had not been called to do that. And perhaps that's the wisdom of Allah that the Prophet ﷺ for 40 years would establish such credibility and he would call people to that credibility. Had he challenged them, he might face the same repercussions that Zayd would have faced at this time. So the Prophet ﷺ has no calling from Allah to reject idol worship actively and publicly. But he doesn't worship idols. Abu Bakr does not worship idols, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abu Bakr says, I was sitting in my room as a kid, and my father brought an idol, put him in front of me, and he said, worship him and ask him for your sustenance. Abu Bakr said, I started talking to him, I said, uh, what's your name? <laughs> he said, the idol didn't answer me. He said, can you do this, 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 and that? And he asked the idol a few questions. He said, this makes no sense whatsoever. You can't even help yourself. I could tip you over and you'll break. So Abu Bakr said, I'm not worshiping idols, right? Zayd, on the other hand, says idol worship is, uh, is, is, is a rejection of the way of Ibrahim Islam, and Zayd will challenge his society in a very unique way. The Prophet Wasallam mentions him that he used to, that the Prophet ﷺ remembered being in a gathering and they served food. Uh, they served meat to the people there and the Prophet ﷺ simply passed. And then when it got to Zayd, Zayd said, إِنِّي لَسْتُ آكُلُ مِمَّا تَذْبَحُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنصَابِكُمْ وَلَا آكُلُ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ مَا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ He said, I will not eat that which was slaughtered in the name of your idols and I will not eat except for that which was slaughtered in the name of Allah. So Zayd takes a very strong stand. Uh, in another instance, Zayd even became more emboldened in challenging them. He said to them, Al-Shatu khalaqaha Allah wa anzala laha min as-sama'i ma' wa anbata laha min al-ard thumma tathbahuna ala thumma tathbahuna ala ghayri ismillah. He said that this, this animal was provided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah created the animal. And then Allah revealed the sustenance that was necessary for the animal to be suitable for slaughter. And then you go and you sacrifice it in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's actually uh, criticizing them at this point and saying, what is wrong with you people? How do you serve this meat? How do you slaughter this meat in the name of other than Allah, dedicated to the idols? When if it was not for Allah, neither the animal nor the sustenance of the animal exists. The Prophet ﷺ even remembered a very personal instance, and this is narrated by Zayd ibn al-Haritha. One thing about the, the, the Sahaba is that when you read in, the, in their biographies, you find there were a lot of Zayds and a lot of Fatimas. 
a lot of Zaids and a lot of Fatimas that existed back then. But there was only one Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the names, you know, like Hind was a very common name. Uh, Zaid was a very common name. Fatima was a very common name. Uh, Khadija is unique, right? So Muhammad and Khadija are very unique names. So the Prophet sallallahu was with Zayd ibn al-Haritha. And Zayd ibn al-Haritha narrates, he says that the Prophet sallallahu met Zayd ibn Amr in a place near Tan'i, which is close to Mecca. And the Prophet ﷺ was the one serving the food in the gathering. So the Messenger of Allah ﷺ is passing out the food in the gathering. So Zayd obviously likes the Prophet ﷺ as a person. He's a noble young man. And he sees some good characteristics in the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. So while the Prophet ﷺ comes to him, Zayd does not respond aggressively to him. Zayd says to him, Yabna akhi, la ta'kul min hadha. He says to him, O son of my brother, O son of my brother, do not eat from this. It was slaughtered in the name of other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's even speaking to the Prophet ﷺ and advising the Prophet ﷺ, don't eat from this, don't serve it, don't participate in any of this. Zayd ibn Haritha says, from that day onwards, the Prophet ﷺ never ate from the meat of Quraysh or served it. So it's, this is the, 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 the position that Zayd ibn Amr is taking in this society of Mecca. He's significantly older than the Prophet ﷺ. Then comes again Zayd now breaking off from this group of four even to be the only one that doesn't become a Christian. But at the same time, obviously he's still considered amongst that group of people because their Christianity was, uh, was still one of Tawheed. And so he still relates to them. He's still considered amongst the group. But Zayd's insistence. Zayd would raise his hands in front of the Kaaba and he would say, Allahumma inni ashhadu anni ala deeni Ibrahim. O oh Allah, I bear witness that I am on the religion of Abraham. I am on the religion of Abraham. So imagine walking around the Kaaba and you got all the idols around. You have this one man standing in front of the Kaaba and, he and he's holding his hands in dua to, towards the Kaaba and he's saying, O oh Allah, bear witness, I bear witness that I am on the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Sma radiallahu ta'ala anha says that when the time of Hajj would come around, now their Hajj was a Hajj of idols, and it was a festival to where these people would make a lot of money. Hajj was their commerce, it was their money, it was their corruption, it was everything to them, right? Because that's where they got the idols prepared, and you know they, prepare, they prepared the, the poetry and the festivals and everything that would take place around the Hajj at that time. And Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha says, I remember that strange sight of Zayd. Zayd, as the festival is carrying out, goes and he puts his hands on the Kaaba with his back on it. I, I really, subhanAllah, when you read these stories, imagine the sight. And he calls out to the people and he says, Ya ma'ashara Quraysh, O Quraysh, O assembly of Quraysh, Wallahi ma minkum ala dini Ibrahim ghayri. He said, I swear that not one of you is on the religion of Abraham except for me. Why? Because Quraysh would admit that this home was built by Ibrahim Aysan. They would say it was built by Abraham. They had murals inside the Kaaba of Abraham and Mary and Jesus salam. They had pictures of them and they had sculptures of them and idols. And they still took pride in being descendants of Ibrahim salam. And Zayd is calling out to them and saying, no one of you is on the religion of Ibrahim salam except for me. So he did this, and what do you think people did? They treated him like he was a madman, right? People ignored him, they mocked him, they continued to go along with their way. It's not like Zayd was walking around breaking idols or being aggressive towards them. He simply was calling out and saying, this is not the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then Asma just relays this very beautiful and touching moment where she says that Zayd uh, would make sujood towards the Kaaba. He prostrate to the Kaaba. And the whole story of Zayd is amazing because he has no revelation to guide him. He doesn't know what ruku' is, what bowing is, and what sujood and what prostration is. But he just, subhanAllah, his intuition, he's guided towards good. There's rushd, there's guidance in his actions. He knows to make sajda, to prostrate towards the Kaaba. And she said he would start to cry. And he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he said this dua, she was curious, Asma was a, was a curious young woman, she said, I heard him say, Allahumma law anni a'lamu ayyul wujuhi ahabbu ilayk, 
عبدتك به ولكني لا أعلم Oh Allah, if only I knew which of the ways was most pleasing to you, I would worship you in accordance with that way, but I don't know. I don't know. And then he says, out of, out of an excuse to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَكِنِّي أَعْبُدَكَ أَعْبُدُكَ هَكَذَا يَا رَبْ But I worship you like this, O oh Allah. So I'm going to do sujood and hope that I'm right. <laughs> I'm going to prostrate to you and hope that I'm right. Now what's significant is that the post-Council uh, of Nicaea Christians were not doing sujood as part, prostration was no longer a part of their prayer. So Zayd is exerting himself to think, what would Ibrahim السلام, do? What was the religion of Abraham? What was the way of Abraham? What is Ibrahim السلام's life about? And, and you know, he's focused, he's really honing in on, he's distinguishing, distinguishing himself with what? His worship and his sacrifice, which is a part of the ritual of worship. Now think about, Think about what's happening in Mecca right now. They've taken the rituals of Ibrahim السلام, which were made for monotheism, made for Tawheed, and they've turned all of them into pagan rituals. The Kaaba was built for the worship of Allah. Tawaf was supposed to be an exclusive remembrance of God and the centering of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the one God. And now they put idols around the Kaaba. Ibrahim السلام, who preached modesty, now they do Tawaf with no clothes around these idols and they sing all sorts of poetry of ignorance. The animals were supposed to be slaughtered as a means of glorifying Allah. قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ Say verily my prayer and my sacrifice. وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ My life and my death are all for the, Allah, the Lord of the worlds. And now the sacrifice is being done in the name of idols, and there's all sorts of, you know, some idols are more valuable than others. So Zayd is seeing this, and Zayd is naturally exerting himself um, uh, you know, uh, uh, away from this. Now, as Zayd becomes more annoying, the person that would walk up to him and torture him was none other than his uncle Al Khattab, the father of Umar. First, Al Khattab started to curse him, then he would spit at him, then he would beat him, then Al Khattab would call for the other people to beat him as well. And he made Zayd's life so difficult that Zayd could no longer enter into Mecca except in secrecy. When Zayd would leave Mecca, he could only come back in, in secrecy because uh, Al-Khattab would release the sufaha, he'd release the, you know, the thugs to beat on him anytime. He said, if you see this man come back into Mecca, I want you to beat him and I want you to teach him a lesson. Because Al-Khattab was a proud man. And so even though Zayd was not harming anybody, but the fact that he was challenging these rituals, that was the way of Al-Khattab. Now you know where Umar anhu was acting out of before he became Muslim, right? You've got a problem, this is how you solve it. He went to the Kaaba to kill the Prophet ﷺ the first time, right? He said, okay, I'm confused now, I'm going to go to the Kaaba and just kill him in front of the Kaaba. Because that's how his father dealt with the challenge of Tawheed. Umar anhu said, well, let me think of that way too. And even the Prophet ﷺ was amazed. And you think about what would be told to the Prophet ﷺ later on, that your people will run you out. The Prophet ﷺ went up to him and asked him one day, he said, Zayd, Ya Zayd, ma li ara qawmaka qad shanafu alayk? Why is it that your people hate you so much? Imagine the Prophet ﷺ has no idea what his future holds, and he's talking to this older man who's challenging paganism all by himself and declaring the way of Ibrahim ﷺ. He says, why is it that your people hate you so much? And Zayd responds and he says, Ya ibn Akhi, O oh, son of my brother, it's because I have left their religion and their idols for the religion and the God of Ibrahim and he and his 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 motto became Ilahi Ilahu Ibrahim wa Dini Dinu Ibrahim. My Lord is the Lord of Abraham. My religion is the religion of Abraham. People would tell him to become a Christian, become a Jew. He would not do it. He, he, you know, they took him to rabbis. They took him to priests. He won't do it. He's certainly not reverting to paganism, but. He's still uh, very uh, curious, right? But at the same time, he has a love and an attachment to Ibrahim Alayhi He sees it as a mission to maintain the way of Ibrahim Alayhi So if you put Zayd in front of a Jew or a Christian, he would, he would hold that rabbi or that priest up to the litmus test of what he viewed as Ibrahim Alayhi When he criticizes the, uh, the people, he criticizes them in the name of Ibrahim Alayhi So he just has a love for Ibrahim السلام, and wants to preserve the way of Abraham and sees that as his sacrifice. Now here's where it gets very interesting about Zayd. Asma' radiallahu anha, she says, وَكَانَ يُحْيِي الْمَوْؤُودَ 
he used to give life to the young girls that would be buried alive. Now obviously, Yuhi al-Ma'uda doesn't mean he raises them from the dead. What is, what is she referring to? He would stop the men from burying their daughters alive. With no guidance from the Qur'an, no wa'idha al-ma'uda to su'ila to be ayyi dhan bin qutilat, when the young girl asks, for, that was buried alive, asks for what crime was I killed? Zayd abhorred this practice, and he didn't just say this is not the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Zayd would actually go, and this is powerful language, wakana yuhi al-ma'uda, Asma says he would give life to them because it's like he was saving their lives because otherwise he would have all of these girls that would be killed. So. What she, what she says is that Zayd used to go out. There was a particular area in Mecca, and I visited that area, subhanAllah, where they, where they actually buried the girls alive. They would they put out ditches and they would bury the girls alive. And this is what Allah talks about in the Quran, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنثَى That when they were given the glad tidings of, of, of a girl, that they would hang their heads in shame. And, 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 and sadness, and they would try to hide from the people because they saw a girl as poverty, they saw a girl as shame. That's the level that these people had reached. And so they would take their young girls in the middle of the night and they would bury them alive. SubhanAllah, think about how nasty that crime is. And Zayd, knowing that, was disgusted by it. So Zayd would go out at the time in which they would take their girls out to bury them. And this is what he would say to them. He would say to the person as they were taking their girls to bury them alive. He would say, لا تقتلها إني أكفيك مؤنتها. He said, don't kill her, I will take care of her. And I'll take care of all of her expenses. So Zayd would take the young girl. He would spend on the girl. He would, he would raise the girl. And then once, this is subhanAllah, you know, this shows you the type of character the man has. Once she, she, she grew up and she became older, he would go back to the parents and he would say, In shi'ta dafa'tuha ilayk. Look, now if you want, I can, I can return her back to you. Or, wa in shi'ta kafaytuka mu'nataha. If you want, I'll take care of marrying her off as well. So the man was raising all these young abandoned girls in Mecca. And then when they reached an age, he would, marry, he would act as their wedi. He would act as their guardian. He would find them the right suitor, and then he would marry them off. SubhanAllah, like where does that come from? Where is that fitrah from? How is the guy making sujood, saving young girls from being uh, uh, buried alive? And SubhanAllah, even, it's, it's narrated about him, uh, he never committed adultery and he never drank alcohol. And in fact, he has a saying, he said, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالزِّنَا فَإِنَّهُ يُورِثُ الْفَقْرِ He said, beware of committing adultery because it bears poverty in your life. So he even would say that I'm, 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 he's, opposed to, he's opposed to zina, he's opposed to adultery and fornication, he's opposed to alcohol. So basically, I mean, he's living this life in accordance with the religion that would come after him. And that was the sincerity of his pursuit of the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Now, he travels the world to try to find guidance, okay? He's on the way of Ibrahim Islam. He says, I want the way of Abraham. Again, he would adopt from Christianity whatever he felt matched up to the way of Abraham. He'd adopt from Judaism whatever he felt matched up to the way of Abraham. But he says, I am on the way of Ibrahim Islam. And him and Waraqa went to a Sham together. So Sham is greater Syria. Uh, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan. He goes there with Waraqa. Waraka, of course, immerses himself in, in, in the literature of, of the Old Testament and the New Testament and in, in the Injil, the, the, the Gospel and the Torah. Uh, Waraka immerses himself. He learns Hebrew. He gets very deep into this and this sort of becomes his life to the point that Waraka becomes a priest. Okay? Waraka would become a priest. Uh, Zayd, on the other hand, uh, continues to travel, is never really satisfied with the answers that he's getting. Uh, and he doesn't have the support of his family. So his uncle tortures him al-Khattab and says, don't come around. If you come around, then you'll be beaten. And he actually tells people to beat him if they see him entering into Mecca again. And his wife would, would become stressed anytime he would say, I'm going to Asham. Because while the people went out to Asham for trade, Zayd would go out to learn more and to try to, to try to answer these questions that were nagging at him about revelation and about the oneness of God and Ibrahim alayhi salam. So his wife is trying to stop him from leaving. His uncle saying, don't come back. And he's torn and he's going around. And um, 
he goes to two places that are very no, that are noteworthy. He goes to Mosul, which, if you remember, in Iraq, the story of, of Salman al Farisi. Salman also went to Mosul in Iraq, so he went to Mosul to study their Christianity in Mosul, and then he went to Asham. And when he went to Asham, he did what Salman did. He said, "Take me to the most knowledgeable Rahib. I want the most knowledgeable scholar amongst you." So they take him to the most knowledgeable scholar amongst you. And after Zayd has argued with rabbis and priests about religion, he comes to this man and he tells this man what he's looking for and what he wants. And this Rahib says to Zayd, he says that the one that you're looking for is due to come out from the land that you left. Go back to Mecca. <laughs> Go back to where you come from. And this Nabi, this prophet is there, is, is going to be sent now. And subhanAllah, he tells him what was told to Salman. By the, last, the last part of the journey of Salman was back in Asham. And the scholar told him, no one's on Millat Ibrahim anymore. But go back to, or, or he told him, go to this land. And he gave him the description. And he said that there's a prophet that will soon come out. So Zayd, this Rahib tells him, listen, the one that you're waiting for, or the, the prophet that you're waiting for, is due to come out from the very same land. So Zayd gets excited. He turns back towards Mecca. He has no idea that that young man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who he used to call Ibn Akhi, my cousin, um, you know, and, and saw such noble, he had no idea that that was going to be the one that was going to be the prophet or the messenger, but he's making his way back uh, to Mecca so that he can await for this prophet. On his way back, he is uh, captured by highway robbers. They steal everything he has. And he's so close, he's in a land called Balqa, very close to Mecca, very close. So he's made it out of Asham, he's getting so close, and he's captured. They steal everything that he has, and after they steal everything that he has, they decide to kill him and cast his body to the side. SubhanAllah, think of all this. And Zayd was around the age of 85 years old at this time. <laughs> so you've spent your whole life on the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, trying to find the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, you're told finally in the same land where you were the lone voice defending monotheism, that the Prophet is coming out there. And then you're going back there and now you're, you're about to be killed. While Zayd was about to be killed, he made this beautiful dua, he made the supplication as, as he was you know, uh, about to be uh, killed. He said, Allahumma, إِنْ كُنْتَ حَرَّمْتَنِي مِنْ صُحْبَةِ نَبِيِّكْ فَلَا تَحْرِمْهَا مِنْ إِبْنِ سَعِيد He said, O oh Allah, if you have forbidden me from the companionship of your Prophet, then do not forbid that companionship from my son Sa'id. So if I'm going to die in this pathetic way, you know, on my way back to Mecca and not find, uh, not find guidance, then I'm content with that. But do not let my son Saeed be prevented from that guidance. So Saeed, he makes dua for him. Atika, and subhanAllah, you know, Zayd was saving other people's daughters, right? Atika bint Zayd would go on to become the wife of five shuhada. <laughs> Sounds crazy, right? And not just any shuhada. First, she was married to Zayd ibn Khattab. Then, after Zayd ibn Khattab, she was married to Abdullah ibn Abi Bakr, the son of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. Then after Abdullah died, Umar ibn al-Khattab married her. Then after Umar died, as Zubair ibn al-Awwam married her. <laughs> and then after she outlived Zubair, after Zubair died, Al-Hassan ibn Ali married her. The same woman married Zayd ibn al-Khattab, the son of Abu Bakr, Umar himself, as Zubair, and the son of Ali, al Hasid ibn Ali, the same woman, and subhanAllah, she never had children from all five of them. So subhanAllah, the same woman would live long enough to marry five of the greatest men that would be, mur that would be martyred. So these were all shuhada at some point, and each time, subhanAllah, actually she died before al Hasan, uh, radiAllahu ta'ala anhu wa an abi. So, they, you know, if, if he was one of the, 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 the people of Mecca, he would have went and buried this girl. But look what his kids become. Sa'id ibn Zayd, one of the first people to accept the Prophet So his du'a was answered 
that he would be at the service of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sa'id is one of the first people to accept the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So just, you know, SubhanAllah, in these moments, he makes dua and he asks Allah that Sa'id has the service of, that he's able to serve the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the way that he would not be able to serve the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sa'id, SubhanAllah, as, as, as Allah's Qadr would have it, Sa'id would marry Fatima, the sister of Umar. You remember that story of Umar bin Khattab going to his sister's house and beating the, the, the husband of his sister? That was Sa'id ibn Zayd. So just like Al-Khattab beat Zayd for his Tawheed, Umar would beat Sa'id for his Tawheed, the son, for his monotheism. But of course, that story instead ends with Umar radiallahu ta'ala who himself becoming a Muslim and, uh, and, and, and being a very close uh, confidant to uh, Sa'id ibn Zayd radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. So why do, where do we pick up with the story? What do you make of this man? <laughs> I mean, what is his fate? Surely Allah would not punish this man. And he died five years before the Prophet ﷺ's birthday. So he died around the year 605. Five years before the Prophet ﷺ even knew that he was going to be a prophet, that Allah would appoint him with prophethood. So it's not like Waraqah who lives sometime. It's he died five years before, was murdered on his way back to Mecca. So Allah knows if he would have even lived, even naturally, to see the Prophet ﷺ uh, come out. So what do we make of this man. And this is where the narrations are just incredibly beautiful. Uh, in an authentic narration, Sa'id and Umar, may Allah be pleased with them, go to the Prophet wasallam, and they are conflicted. Sa'id wants to ask the Prophet وسلم, what happened to his father. Umar wants to know what happened to his uncle. And they're afraid of the answer. Like, is it possible that this man spent his life on monotheism? and striving for guidance, and doing all these noble acts just from his natural akhlaq, noble character, and he's in hell? I mean, what do we make of him? Can we say, radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him? Can we, can, can we make dua for him? So Sa'id starts off and he says, Ya Rasulullah, you know my father, and you know who he was. Like, I don't even have to go, I don't have to make a case. O Messenger of God, you know who my father was. And they asked the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, They didn't ask him, is he in heaven or hell? Because it would be too painful if the Prophet ﷺ was to say he's in hell, right? That's, that would have been too hard for them to hear. So instead they asked, can we seek forgiveness for him? And the Prophet ﷺ said, lahu, Seek forgiveness for him. He said, for, for by Allah I saw on the day of judgments on the Day of Judgment as the Prophets line up with their Ummah behind them, with their nations behind them. 124,000 Prophets all line up on the Day of Judgment. Behind them are their nations. Some Prophets have one person, some have uh, 10, some have 10,000, some have 80. The Prophet ﷺ has the largest nation after him, the nation of Musa Islam, of Moses, peace be upon him. So these large nations line up behind their prophets, right? And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّهُ يُبْعَثُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أُمَّةً وَحْدًا That he will be resurrected all by himself as an ummah. The man is an ummah, he's a nation. And in an authentic narration, this is so touching because it gives you the vivid image. He says, بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ عِيسَى بْنِ مَرْيَمِ Between me and Jesus, the son of Mary. <laughs> So while the lines of the Prophets are there, and may Allah make us amongst those standing behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma ameen, with his testimony for us. Imagine you're lining up behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and you're looking, and you see Jesus over there, Isa alayhi and between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and Isa alayhi wa there's this one man standing all by himself, and he is an ummah all by himself. He is a nation all by himself, and that is Zayd ibn Amr radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is, uh, you know, it's incredible because, the, you know, Allah says about Ibrahim alayhi salam, what? Ibrahim كان ummah. Ibrahim was a nation in and of himself in regards to the good that he used to do. What Ibrahim alayhi salam, what came out of Ibrahim alayhi salam was the good of an entire nation. From that one man of Abraham came a nation of good, right? 
And here you have Zayd who had this love for Ibrahim and the way of Ibrahim, standing by himself literally as an ummah. Literally as an ummah, no prophet. He cannot be fit in any other way. He can't be fit in any other way except as a nation in and of itself. There's more to this. And it gets more beautiful as you dive into these narrations. Amr ibn Rabi'ah, he was a companion of Zayd. Amr ibn Rabi'ah was one of the first to accept Islam. He came to the Prophet وسلم, uh, in the fourth year after the call of the Prophet وسلم, which is relatively early if you consider the private and then public call of Islam. And he told, he was in tears telling the Prophet وسلم, this story. He says that I was sitting with Zayd one day and Zayd says to me, Ya Amr, he says, Inni antadiru nabiyan min waladi Ismail. He said, listen, I'm waiting for a prophet from the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. I want you to know I'm waiting for a prophet from the descendants of Ismail alayhi salam. He said that he will be on the way of Ibrahim, he will call to Ibrahim, and he pointed to the Kaaba and he said, and he will pray to this Qibla. He will pray in this direction. He has no idea it's Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. He says, but I'm waiting for this prophet. And he said to him, should I live to see him, I will believe in him. U'minu bihi. I will believe in him. And I will support him. And I will testify that he is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he said, I have a feeling I'm not going to live long enough to see him. I just have a bad feeling that I'm going to die before he comes out. Amr was relatively younger. So he said to Amr, فَإِذَا رَأَيْتَ If you see him, أَقْرِئْهُ مِنِّي السلام. He said, give my salam to him. It's beautiful, subhanAllah. He said, when you see him, give my salam to him. And follow him. So Abn Rabi'ah said, when the Prophet ﷺ made the call, he said, I went to the Prophet ﷺ. And I became Muslim. And I gave him salam for me. And I told him, I said, you know, Zayd was sitting with me. And Zayd said that I don't think I'm going to live long enough to see you, but if I do see him, I will believe in him and support him and testify that he's a prophet. And he told me, if I live to see you, أَقْرِئْهُ مِنِّي salam. So I'm giving salam to you from Zayd. So the Prophet ﷺ gave salam back. وَتَرَحَمَ عَلَيْهِ Meaning he made dua that Allah have mercy on Zayd, which gives us the answer about saying رضي الله عنه ورحمه الله doing the same prayers that we would do for any companion of the Prophet And he said to him, to Amr, he said, Wallahi qad ra'aytuhu fil jannah yashabu dhiyula. He said, I swear by Allah, I saw Zayd in Jannah dragging his garments. He, was, he has a long garment in paradise, carrying his garment, walking through in Jannah, walking through in paradise. And another authentic hadith, the Prophet said, Dakhaltu al-jannah فَرَأَيْتُ لِزَيْدِ بْنُ عَمْرُ بْنُ نُفَيْلِ دَرَجَتَيْنِ He said, I entered into Jannah, I entered into paradise, and I saw that Allah has reserved two levels of paradise for one man, for Zayd. That Allah gave him two levels of paradise all by himself. SubhanAllah. So the, the narrations go on, and, and I think it's befitting that we end with, a, with the eulogy. The eulogy was given, or the one who heard of his death and said these beautiful words about him was none other than his close friend Waraka, who we'll talk about next week. And Waraka uh, said these, these words of him in eulogy. He said, so I'll go through it. Rashatta wa an'amta ibn Amru wa inama. You were all together on the right path. Uh, you were all together guided on the right path, O son of Amr, and gained the bounty. And he says, Tajannabta tannuran min nari hamiya. And you saved yourself from the oven of the blazing fire. And then he said, بِدِينِكَ رَبًّا لَيْسَ رَبٌّ كَمِثْلِهِ By choosing a Lord who has no equal to him. وَتَرْكُكَ أَوْثَانَ التَّوَاغِيَ كَمَا هِيَ And by your abandoning of the vain idols as they are. وَقَدْ تُدْرِكُ الْإِنسَانَ رَحْمَةُ رَبِّهِ And verily the mercy of, the, of, of, of his Lord will reach a man. 
وَلَوْ كَانَ تَحْتَ الْأَرْضِ سِتِينَ وَادِيَا Even if he was 60 layers beneath the earth, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reach him. فَرَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَ عَنْهُ وَرَحِيمُهُ اللَّهُ May Allah be pleased with him and have mercy on him. Obviously, you know, I think as far as lessons are concerned, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks about this idea of intuition, of the, of, of the righteousness of a Muslim, that a soul that is at peace with Allah is naturally guided to the things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when the fitrah is intact, when, the, when, when a person's natural disposition towards God is intact, that they will naturally find themselves in that worship and in that service. And even though Zayd had absolutely no idea of what was to come after him, but that's the sincerity. You see what's very prevalent in, in many of these stories that we'll go through is a refusal to be complacent. A refusal to be complacent. And to look deeper into society uh, around him and Zayd thinking deeply and deeply and deeply about theology and becoming the person uh, that he was. So we ask Allah to have mercy upon him and to be pleased with him. And uh, you Taala, know, we will continue next week, inshallah, with the story of Waraqa, which I'm, which I'm really looking forward to because it's another fa one of those fascinating stories and you can see the makings of that society, those sparks of Tawheed, those sparks of monotheism that exist before the Prophet وسلم, in that Meccan society. And also the fact that the Tawheed of Ibrahim السلام, comes with far more implications than merely worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Zayd was guided to protect the young girls that were being buried alive, guided away from zina and khamr, guided away from adultery and from uh, intoxication, guided to all of these good things in a natural way. And that is the way of Ibrahim alayhi salam, not merely the worship of Allah, but the honoring of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with everything else.